as we know, you know, with so much going on, how hard it is to, to make the extra time to, to be a part of this, you know, this initiative we've been working on now for a good part of the year. And, uh, you know, as you'll hear, you know, a, a, a large chunk of the project was also related to a report that we had been hoping to release and uh, which we've, you know, we've postponed a while given the impact of the pandemic and the sort of the incredible intensity that we need to focus, whether on the personal and family health level or on the sort of the organizing level that so many of us are also doing to try and figure out how to make a way through this and make our way to the other side. So, so welcome to, to everyone today. You know, uh, what we're going to be sharing is really this initiative uh, that we have underway that's a collaboration of a number of groups, some of whom I'll name in a bit, to really look at bringing together diverse sectors together across business, legislators, science, health, advocates, and the like, you know, all so that we could look at the impact, the environmental impact as a causal factor, particularly of toxic chemicals, you know, on childhood cancer and the like, and figure out a pathway forward to move us towards a greater acceptance, understanding of and acceptance, and then advocacy, policy work, and other actions that we'll talk about, you know, towards prevention. The, uh, So some of the, the, the groups that, you know, have been very intimately involved in the development of the report that we'll be talking about some of the findings on, again, not publicly released, and some of the groups that are at the core of this initiative, you know, include the Cancer Free Economy Network, uh, you know, which really is a, a group bringing together many different organizations to help us move towards multiple strategies from market strategies to policy strategies to dealing with the, the issues around race and equity and the like, you know, to move towards a cancer-free economy. You'll hear from the, today from the, the Lowell Center for Sustainable Production, there's the Children's Environmental Health Network, Clean Production Action, Clean and Healthy New York, the Max Cure Foundation, and made safe, you know, are some of the core organizations that have been a part, but it's a very open process for us in terms of in, including other organizations and the like, but it gives you a sense of the diversity of the kinds of groups that we've tried to bring into this initiative and to help us build it out, lifting up each of the work of, of each of the organizations, but getting to a greater greater than the sum of the parts through our collective work together. So, you know, in the report, you know, just want to give you, you know, a little bit of a view of some of the diverse sets of folks that both contributed to this, you know, cross-sector approach to childhood cancer prevention, as well as some of the reviewers, some of the other folks that provided resources and the like. So you could see it really runs the, the gamut of, of you know, the, you know a, a diversity of organizations represented, but also sectors and, and different stakeholders in the process. You know, and again, still open to even, even diversifying that further. So, you know, for, t for today, you know, what we were going to do is sort of take you through uh, a number of the aspects that appear as the sections of the report, but also about, you know, some of our approach and strategy around the initiative, you know, um, uh, for moving this work forward. So you'll hear from N.C. Witherspoon, heads up the Children's Environmental Health Network on the, the trends in, in childhood cancer and you know, what we could look at to really understand why this needs to get paid attention to, you know, and then move over to Molly Jacobs from the Lowell Center to get us deeper into the science case behind this as well. Over to Howard Williams from Clean Production Action to run us through the business case. And then Bobby, Bobby Wildling 
from Clean and Healthy New York to run us through some of the, the, the thinking around policy. And then I'll take it back and really start to talk about the initiative and involvement and the, you know, you know where we're going to be at in terms of the report, et cetera. So um, I'm going to now see if I can share this quickly with NSAID, see if uh, it's, it's allowing me to do it. And I saw how to do it before, and I don't see how to do it now. So NSAID, I will... I will just do this and you tell me where to go from there. Okay, thank tell you so much. Advance. Thank you so much and thank you to everyone for joining and thanks David for that great introduction to I think this extremely important effort. So here we have worked to provide the overall case uh, for childhood cancer prevention. Uh, child cancer, which is the cancer diagnosed among people under the age of 20 is rare. The risk of a child in the United States developing cancer before their 20th birthday is about one in 264 cases. However, that actually translates to over 16,000 diagnosed in the year 2019, and cancer still does remain the leading cause of death by disease past infancy among children in the United States. So while deaths are decreasing, incidence is on the rise. Cancer incidence among people under the age of 20 has increased from 1975 to 2016 at roughly a 0.7% each year. So again, while that might seem small, it's extremely significant here, especially pertaining to the vulnerability of children and how this type of disease can certainly have lifelong implications, even if uh, you are, um, you know, if you come out of it, uh, you know, through treatment and everything. Leukemia, brain, central nervous system cancers, and lymphomas are the most common cancers in children. And the rates of cancer, of leukemia, excuse me, are highest among Latinx children. Next slide, please. Thank you. Childhood cancers impart significant costs, so both financial and on the social side of things. Hospitalizations in 2009 totaled nearly a billion dollars and 36% of an increase over less than a decade and are, and are still climbing. So these um, realities for families um, are truly incredible. A survey conducted by the National Children's Cancer Society found that one in five families who receive a new diagnosis of childhood cancer are already living in poverty. So the survey also indicates that families reported losing more than 40% of their annual income as, an, as a result of work you know, disruption, not being able to go on a regular basis related to the children's cancer treatments. And this figure does not account for the out-of-pocket expenses, like at times multiple trips to the hospital that could be very far from one's home and extra childcare for other children. Next slide, please. So children are certainly susceptible to a variety of, uh, do we miss a, could you go back? We might have missed a, yeah, thank you. So the case for prevention, there, there are complications here, right? If it was so easy, I suspect we would have had this all figured out by now. But I mean, the alarm is completely being sounded by some of our most vulnerable children as far as what we need to be doing. With prevention, it's extremely hard because you don't see the faces of children who have cancer um, you know, that could have been, that was prevented by social action, policy action, public health action. So there isn't a poster child or award or accolades for the medical profession or research profession that helped, unlike cancer treatments, right, on the treatment side where the primary focus is traditionally on the treatment versus prevention side. But a focus on environmental risk factors is, a, is an incredible opportunity for us. Traditional cancer risk factors are not the, ca the cause, and at times that is what is considered or, out, or uh, provided as, as preventive behavior. Quitting smoking, working on your diet, increasing your exercise, or having, you know, being a part of uh, too much sun exposure. But the risks in our environment cannot be ignored. Next slide, please. So from conception on, children can be exposed to pollutants that are passed along by their parents. In utero, through breast milk, and by the use of household furniture, toys, and consumer products that contain toxic chemicals, even once born, and also um, at times through blood from in utero as well. 
All of us in the environmental health profession are commonly working to elevate the truth that children are not little adults. We cannot consider our policies for the young, uh, adult, uh, young child to also mimic that of what an adult, in many cases, male can sustain. Children experience disproportionate exposures to environmental toxicants on a daily basis. They have high susceptibility to hazardous chemicals in their environment that begins at the fetal stage and continues throughout adolescence and then adulthood. During these developmental periods, children's bodies are in a dynamic state of growth with cells that are multiplying and organ systems, every single organ system developing at a rapid rate. Many don't understand that the lung system, for example, is still developing well into the toddler years for young children. So anything coming in contact to that normal stage of development can really be a problem. Pound for pound, children breathe more, drink more, and actually take in more food than adults. If an infant or a child spends time near roadways, for example, that have high elements of air pollutant exposure from vehicle traffic, then they will actually experience a much higher relative dose of carcinogens compared to adults in the same scenario. Their behaviors place them at risk and children you know, are playing on the ground and they're putting their fingers in their mouth and they're crawling and they put in you know, other toys and elements as they're learning and developing in their mouths. And while that's normal development, that whole behavior system actually creates harm as well. Next slide, please. So there's no doubt that we have made gains to reduce exposure to critical environmental toxicants. Yet there are a number of toxic chemicals used and released that have been allowed to increase exponentially with minimum requirements for understanding their true impact on human health. And there's a growing body of robust science and documentation to the potential uh, link to cancer in many of these cases. All of you may as well understand that the chemical toxic soup that children are exposed to on a daily basis are vast. Um, from pesticides to air pollution to toxicants like PFAS or flame ret retardants and household products, electronics, furniture, clothing, toys, on and on and on. All of these ex experiences are resulting in a, a range of exposures for chemicals to children and especially with unknown implications on their health and development in their childhood and even into their adult years. And in many cases, again, these chemicals chemicals have not been tested and studied, which is a huge concern. Next slide, please. So prevention is possible here, and it's the critical piece of this entire report. As Molly will describe next, the science is strong for several categories of environmental risk factors in childhood cancer. We know from work on tobacco sensation that when we focus on reducing risk to known carcinogens, prevention actually is possible. In the case of lung cancer, we have experienced a study in significant reduce in lung cancer incidence as a result of you know, preventive efforts. So what is needed to advance prevention relative to childhood cancers? We need to act on what we know, the science available. We need to have near-term actions to reduce exposures to known carcinogens. We need longer-term investments, safer materials and products that have the dual promise of harnessing innovation and prevention. The case that Howard and Bobby will tell us more about, and we also need to understand more, right? But we have a lot of ground and foundation to move on for prevention of all families currently today. The National Cancer Institute has a minimum budget dedicated to researching causes of childhood cancers, and only a fraction of that minimal budget actually supports investigation into chemical risk factors. Thank you. So great. Well, thank you, Ense. And, you know, showing the slide again, as Ense revealed, um, you know, the incidence of childhood cancers are on the rise. And um, this increase is just uh, too fast to be explained by, for example, changes in our genes or um, changes in, uh, and it also just can't be explained by changes in, in uh, diagnostic techniques. Um, so what is the evidence to support links to environmental risks um, and childhood cancers? So we found based on a review of pooled studies and meta-analyses that the weight of evidence is sufficient to warrant preventative actions for a, for a number of risk factors. Um, and it's important here to emphasize that the exposures that we're talking about um, aren't just to children themselves, it's parents in their homes, it's parents in their workplaces, 
um, as well as early life exposures to children that are contributing to these risks. Um, so next slide, please, David. So the first category of risk factors that we found a robust evidence linking childhood cancers and environmental exposures is to pesticides. And this is particularly relevant for childhood leukemias and brain cancers. Um, we see two types of exposure circumstances um, at play here, both residential use of, of pesticides as well as occupational use by um, parents themselves. So for the residential side, um, we see that both insecticides and herbicides are, are implicated. Um, for leukemia, we see that risk is more consistently elevated with um, exposure to indoor uh, insecticide use, um, and that the risk is, is elevated both um, based on maternal exposure prior to conception, as well as in utero exposure and early life exposure. So you'll see these themes around the timing of exposure um, being a, a really critical part of the investigations of how researchers are looking at these risk factors and seeing what timing actually matters in terms of elevated risk. For brain cancer, we see that risk is elevated based on exposure in utero um, to, um, to, the, um, um, to the fathers, um, and as well as um, exposure prior to conception. Um, for exposures in workplaces, um, we see that leukemia is particularly elevated based on in, in utero exposure. Um, and for brain cancer, both paternal and maternal exposures are increasing risk. Um, and I think, you know, across all of these, we really tried to pay attention to see where the disparities lie. Um, and it's really important to emphasize here that we see children exposed to really high levels of agricultural pesticides. Um, and these are often from low income and immigrant com communities. Um, and to say that there are a number of registered pesticides in the US that the International Agency for Research on Cancer, this box in the green on the right, have classified as either known or suspected carcinogens. So while this research often looks at just the category of either insecticides or, or herbicides, rarely has it looked at like individual brands, individual chemicals themselves. Um, we do know from uh, research on, on cancer in adults that a number of these pesticides have been in implicated as carcinogenic. Next slide. The next category we, we saw was with an association with exposure to near traffic um, air pollution, traffic related air pollution. And this is particularly robust for the connection with childhood leukemia. Um, we see, interestingly, that it's exposures in early childhood, so after the child is born, um, that are of greatest concern for this increased risk. Um, most of the studies have examined risk in relation to, um, to uh, pro the proximity to traffic density, and this is mostly used as a, mo a, a measure of exposure to the toxicants that are actually in vehicle exhaust. That's the majority of the studies, but some studies have actually looked at individual pollutants. And we do see risk elevated with specific types of air pollutants, particularly benzene, one through butadiene, as well as PAHs. Um, and once again, where we have looked at particular issues of disparities, we do see, for example, that when the uh, Latino fathers are exposed to uh, at work to PAHs and exhaust emissions, um, their children appear to have elevated risk of childhood leukemia. And again, even though it's mostly benzene, one beauty dyeing that we, and PAHs that we see connected to childhood leukemias, there's a number of other carcinogens that we know exist in air pollution as classified by the International Agency on Research on Cancer. Next slide, please. Oop, one, one back, there we go. All right, so the, the last um, uh, category here that we really found strong evidence connecting childhood cancer um, is that for exposure to solvents and paints. And this is particularly true for childhood leukemia. Um, so for, um, so for uh, the, ex the, the issue of um, paints, we see that risk is particularly elevated based on exposure shortly before conception. Um, again, during pregnancy, so in utero and also in your, uh, early in life. So across those three critical time periods of development. Um, just going down to the uh, uh, links with um, solvent exposure, 
Um, benzene is, is the one solvent that has actually a very deep li literature on its connection uh, with childhood leukemia. And we see in particular that it, it's uh, moms in their workplaces, um, if exposed to leukemia during their pregnancy, is a particular concern. But we also see that father's exposures, again, also it, uh, workplace exposures, um, are also contributing to risk. Benzene is the solvent that's been mostly studied, but there's a number of other um, organic or chlorinated solvents, such as trichloroethylene, that has been the basis of some studies. Um, and again, just to say, we know that there's a number of solvents out there that have documented risks with cancer. These studies have been particularly examined in adults, um, but just to elevate this connection between cancer and a number of these uh, carcinogens is, is important to keep in mind. Next slide. Um, and so, you know, what do we say about some of these other exposures? I think it's just important to say that um, carcinogens, like those boxes that we just showed in the previous slides, um, have been classified um, as of concern based on kind of studies in, in adults. And so for a range, you know, we, we don't, this is a very small set of, of risk factors, especially considering um, the world of toxicants that our environmental health movement examines. And so, you know, what about the other toxicants of concern? And again, a number of them have been um, studied with regard to impacts on adults. They have not been studied with regard to impacts on children. Um, but we need to, you know, not ignore that evidence of carcinogenicity. It just simply doesn't make sense to expose um, children to a carcinogen if we know that it exists. Um, and so in terms of other lines of evidence, um, whether it's, it's um, you know, our PFAS chemicals or it's, um, you know, exposures in artificial turf, you know, that have given rise to concerns, for example, about brain cancers in children or some of our endocrine disrupting um, cancers, we say specifically in this paper that a lack of evidence about environmental contributors to other kinds of pediatric cancers does not absolve a broader set of environmental risk factors from responsibility for the range of cancers. Instead, it likely reflects the inherent challenges in studying the associations of, between environmental risk factors and rare diseases, as well as a lack of funding to support such investigations. And just to elevate that, you know, I, we, we went and we've talked about brain cancers and leukemias, and in some cases, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. These are the most common cancers, as, as NSA um, uh, stated. And so these are the ones that typically are, are studied. It's incredibly hard to study a rare disease. So for rhabdomyosarcomas or bone cancers or for Wilms, Wilms tumors, um, these rarer types of childhood cancers are just far less studied. And so again, it's not evidence of safety with regard to these exposures. We just haven't studied them. So next, next slide. So just to, um, so just to uh, leave us with this, are we really willing to act? We have this robust evidence. Um, it's, it's documented, it's there. Um, there's clear pathways for prevention, but are we really ready to act? Um, and there's two notable quotes that we included in this report. Um, one from a researcher at UC Berkeley, Catherine Metier, who says, to protect children's health, it's prudent to establish programs to alter exposure to those factors with well-established associations, um, rather than to suspend judgment until no uncertainty remains. And that's absolutely at the position that this initiative holds. Um, and lastly, a quote from Sandra Steingraber, our, hero, our her heroine amongst us. Um, what is the burden of childhood cancers attributable to, ke uh, to chemical toxicants in our environment? We do not know, fully know until we do another experiment, which is to replace these toxicants with safer chemicals, materials, and products, and observe subsequent cancer trends. So let's take this out and see what happens. Take these toxicants out and see what happens. Um, and with that, I think we're passing the baton to Howard. Thank you. The report opens with an introduction by Dr. Landrigan. And in that, you know, the obvious call for a natural cancer prevention plan, then to be successful, needs to support the people in every sector of American society, in every region of our country and of all political beliefs and persuasions. This is 
oh, there is a wholeness that's needed to this work. And when we look from a business perspective, does business have a supporting role in something so large and something that's associated with health? No, it does not have a supporting role. It has a leadership role. Leadership, and as you listen to the words that Ense and Molly used, Ense, safer materials and products. Molly, how many times, reflect back, how many times did we see the word and hear the word exposure throughout Molly's presentation? It wasn't redundancy, it's importance. And when we look at the ways that uh, you know, the prevention is to not just reduce exposure, but to eliminate the exposure. I like that quote that she had at the end of her slide that said, let's just, let's eliminate these and watch what happens. And there is a complexity to doing that. And that is really in this intense awareness of, you just look at the images of childhood cancer. There needs to be an intense reaction. And that reaction and intensity of change and intensity of innovation needs to come to play. Next slide, please. And it's really, there is a business case for this. There is a business case for stepping away from hazard risk exposure. Well, you can't control exposure. You can control what is being exposed in reducing and eliminating hazard and economies reward business. I've yet to meet anyone that says, wow, you know, business should not make money doing the right thing. Well, businesses must because economies reward that greater good. And as greater good is rewarded, greater good becomes university of, universally available. The real change is an economic driven change. Econ economies will drive change further faster. Next slide, please. And throughout the report in the business section, there are a number of examples given as to the why, the, the, the rewards, uh, the purpose, the value of purpose. And in looking at materials, materials and products are generally inanimate. You know, we can't change the human behavioral issues that are by choice, but we can change the inanimate objects and materials that are coming into people's lives. We have that opportunity in business to do this. Ultimately, there's a risk reduction and there is a wellness benefit. But when we look at legislatively level playing fields, they alone aren't high enough because they're too easily flooded, too easily flooded by disinterest and special interest. And that's where private enterprise needs to step in, has a great opportunity to step in and to lift this to higher ground for a higher purpose and a higher outcome, because that is what is needed. We need to pull the hazardous materials out. We need to stop surrounding children with inanimate objects that contribute to illness and lead to illness. And when children benefit, the entire world benefits. We all benefit from that opportunity of wellness. Next slide, please. So as business investors have a leading role to play in reducing the impact of toxic chemicals as a causal factor in pediatric cancer and other childhood diseases. We need leadership. We need leadership that seeks to understand, to seek to have that awareness. And within that awareness to create and create new products create better products, create better chemistry that leads to a greater good. And the greater good can be described in many ways, but good has one big meaning, and that is something better. And that greater good in an economy, especially now, when, when we have now, because of our current circumstances with COVID-19, come to understand how comorbidities play a role, but also too, how getting to that plays a, a role. And lifting this higher is just is simply valuing our children and children are a leading indicator 
of the tomorrow in so many ways, but also in human health. Business can step up, business can do this, and there are a lot of other great conversations to have, but I'll stop chattering and pass it on. Thank you. Thanks, Howard. Hi, I'm, I'm Bobby Wilding. I'm Deputy Director of Clean and Healthy New York. Um, and so you've heard about the, the reasons why we need to take action and address uh, pediatric cancer. You've heard some of the evidence that we have for um, uh, specific chemicals or materials that are, um, we, we have confidence are contributing to childhood cancer and how business can, can play a role. There's also a really strong role for, um, for government to play. And I think that there's a really powerful interplay when you have businesses that see that higher purpose and lead the way, demonstrating the, the doability of, of uh, a better system. And then yes, government creates a floor and it can create an ever higher floor to ensure that we don't slide backwards, um, you know, should uh, focuses shift. And so there's a really powerful opportunity for government at all sorts of different levels to play an important role in preventing childhood cancer. Next slide, please. So if you look at the background in this slide, you'll maybe be able to dimly make out what was New York City in the 1960s. Um, before we had broad federal laws setting limits on air pollution and water pollution um, and what could go inside our products, um, there were experiences people uh, were having, they were once considered uh, controversial ideas, but they were changed by changing the laws. So for example, there are laws on the books forbidding the use of oily rags inside children's stuffed animals. Today, we would be aghast if anybody thought of putting anything in except for fresh, clean fill. Um, but that was once a, a problem that we faced and was solved by having government regulation. Uh, we have used federal legislation and laws and regulations to make sure that there are no small parts in products made for babies and toddlers. And uh, we've, we've seen many clearer air days in cities like New York City, uh, Los Angeles, and elsewhere. And of course, as we've reduced our driving voluntarily or perhaps not quite voluntarily, we've seen the air get even clearer. Um, next slide, please. So here's just one really great example that we have very concrete evidence for the way in which government regulation was instrumental in improving the health of children. And that has to do with lead poisoning. So uh, we've known that there are problems with lead affecting um, brain development and also many or other organ development um, for a very long time. But it was the early 1970s when uh, action began taking place in uh, the U.S. And as things like uh, bans on uh, lead paint, phasing out of lead and gasoline, um, tightening up regulations around lead and plumbing, um, and, and tightening down and ratcheting down all of those restrictions, um, you see over time that as the um, these actions came into play, blood lead levels plummeted. And now um, we have many, many fewer children who are being uh, poisoned by lead and, and many of the children who are being exposed to lead in situations where it's a legacy of uh, the time, you know, paint on walls, et cetera, from a time before these uh, laws went into place. So we can really see that swift, that overarching government action can have a, a profound effect. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, a number of the laws that are in place to safeguard our environment in ways that can uh, protect against uh, cancer are under threat. So this is a slide that's probably even now, although it's not, it's maybe a month old, it may be out of date. The current administration is uh, rapidly attacking environmental uh, regulations, uh, attempting to loosen restrictions on air pollution, um, making it easier to, to drill and extract uh, fossil fuels, um, 
loosening regulations on toxic substances or using existing laws to um, approve or uh, downplay the harm of chemicals where there's robust information. And it goes on and on. There are a total of almost 100 rollbacks being proposed or put into place um, right now. And so that, that floor that um, Howard was talking about that could be easily flooded is being uh, lowered in, in too many cases at the federal level. Next slide, please. So that's where the power of multiple governments comes into play for the United States. We have the ability to um, make changes at state levels um, and uh, also at the federal level, and those can provide internal safeguards and, and backstops. Um, but there are 10 policies that we identify in the forthcoming report that really focus on, um, or actions that focus on ways that government policy can play an, an, a critical role in preventing childhood cancer. So those include um, protecting existing uh, laws and um, reversing the rollbacks, making sure that the Environmental Protection Agency focuses on enforcing existing regulations, expanding air quality and water protections, and a number of states are leading the way in that regard, requiring reduction or elimination of pesticide use um, by measures such as integrated pest management. Um, pesticides are, as um, Molly discussed, one of the, the key um, kinds of chemicals that are directly connected with increased rates of childhood cancer. We can require safer materials in children's products and our built environment because it's not just the products made for kids, but the products that all families use um, that can have an impact and bring chemicals like PAHs, which uh, Molly also discussed, into our homes and into our, our um, spaces where our children are. Next slide, please. We need to increase funding for research into cancer prevention. Molly talked a lot about what we don't know um, and there's a need to fund that research to understand more, um, but not waiting for all of that research to come in before we take action. We can use government and institutional dollars to purchase non-toxic options. So that's a way that governments can, um, in essence, engage in that marketplace and reward business leaders that are um, creating the solutions by investing um, uh, tax dollars into those kinds of products and solutions. Um, we also need to make sure that children's spaces like child care centers are sited safely so that they are removed to the greatest extent possible from zones around heavily trafficked areas that release a lot of the chemicals that Molly discussed from uh, as a direct connection from traffic. Um, she also talked about artificial turf and so there are um, a number of uh, products where we need transparency. So we need to understand what chemicals are present in products or areas that are intended for use by children so that we can take action to remove those harmful chemicals. Next slide. So, the, you know, the bottom line here is that um, we need innovation to, to guide us, and then we need to have our society establish ground rules. And that's really what federal reg regulation does. It establishes the ground rules in which everyone must play, and we need to be constantly raising that um, as a way to protect our children from uh, chemicals that can contribute to cancer. Thanks so much. David? All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, so I think if you've heard it once, you, you did hear it several times throughout the course of the, the presentations that, that we're really calling for, you know, not only greater understanding, but really action on prevention. And that th this is something that, you know, the, the groups represented here today, as well as the broader coalitions like Cancer Free Economy, network, you know, American Sustainable Business Council's broad network, et cetera, are committed to, to trying to push forward and the like. And we're, we're believing that the actions that are needed need to take place across many different stakeholders and sectors. So, you know, part of the, the, the calls to action that, you know, we'll be pushing out in the report 
There'll be a complimentary video that will, will go out alongside this, a social media campaign that will be moving. But, you know, the, the key here if, that you heard today is that, you know, some of the, the key actions here are to produce and purchase safer chemicals and products. So, right, the role of business, the role of consumers, but also the role of government in procurement is a part of this. The investment in more prevention research, you know, as you heard, there's a lot known and there's still a lot more that needs to be known, particularly then when you drive it down to the impact on children. You know, and clearly, you know, if we're looking for systemic change, it's really public policy, you know, that really looks at it from both ends, right? To incentivize safer chemicals and products, really motivating business to actually step up, you know, and move further down this direction. Clearly there are a, quite a number of businesses that are already practicing using green chemistry, using safer chemicals principles as a part of their work. But there's a lot more that need to be encouraged down there and public policy can go a long way in actually moving things much quicker than they're moving at the present moment. And then, right alongside, sorry, alongside that really is really the, the, the regulations end of it, right? So we've got the carrot and the stick, you know, incentivize the good behavior really and start to, to really, you know, punish and, and unfortunately, you know, we're in a period where we see way too much deregulation and the like, you know, the, you know, the, you know so whether it's on on chemicals, it's on clean water, it's on climate action and the like. This idea of just removing all these, you know, with the hopes that somehow, you know, that's going to improve the economy. Well, we know what happens when it moves in a totally unregulated form. And so having businesses articulate, you know, this, you know, to counter the sort of the short term profit at all costs perspective is part of the work that ASBC and other groups have taken up. But this idea of working across sectors, like we're talking about in all of this work, to sort of advance public policy is key to the work that we want to move forward with. So, so as you've heard, we're talking a, a good deal about this report that's still embargoed, that's pretty much finished, making a last few edits and now, you know, as of our call just the other day, we're now talking about, you know, uh, a release in September, you know, when we're hoping, you know, everything that we've seen is that there's very little bandwidth right now to have media pay attention to this and for, for many folks to be able to pay attention to the release of a report around childhood cancer, even though childhood cancer is not stopping because of the pandemic. So we are working on a communications plan, not only for the release of the report, but also, you know, for our work over the next series of months before we actually release the report to keep raising up the kinds of points that were raised on the webinar today. Then we're going to move, you know, when the report gets distributed, we're going to look towards, you know, many different allies. You know, part of today was to really look at beginning to build the partnership with the Wellbeing Alliance, another national effort to really look at um, a very holistic approach to wellness and the like, and how to invite that community in to working with us on this, this effort. You know, as we said, engagement of business organizations, we want to look towards the Pediatric Cancer Foundation. As you look at a lot of the Cancer Foundation work, right? It's about the cure. It's about the cure. And that's important work to continue. But what we're saying, this is an added component that needs to be addressed is really about prevention. And so how do we influence those? How do we influence legislators? How do we get the word out to parents, communities, and others that are impacted, heavily impacted? As we heard, low-income communities, communities of color, frontline communities, et cetera. So it's really about a broader, inclusive communications and education and joint advocacy strategy is what the larger childhood cancer prevention initiative is looking towards. So 
part of the ways that you can participate in this is we do have monthly calls. You know, you can send um, this uh, contact information for the email below that you can send uh, to us and then we'll, we'll get you uh, loaded in, get you access to the resources we created. You know, two, as I mentioned, is the report release uh, that we will be making in September and how you could help us to get that report out there and use that as a foundational key resource, you know, for further educating and advocacy. You know, three is we've got a core team that's really looking at the policies and how we can engage with Congress, but also then there's opportunity at the state level as well, or at the local level to move these issues. <clears throat> You know, we were most effective when we were able to, we, we moved the number of state efforts that gets us to federal policy, right? It brings folks to the table when they're concerned about too many different state regulations. So <clears throat> there's a number of ways that we can approach the policy advocacy work. And then, you know, as we said, you know, a variety of different constituencies that, you know, others can help open the doors to and then you know join us in helping to identify what the additional strategies are so we can move towards a world that you know is helping to prevent and is preventing childhood cancer at the kind of scale that's necessary so you know down below is the also the website that is you know up and running now but also you know <clears throat> you know, is going to be expanded as we move further on in this initiative. So with that, um, you know, uh, the direct URL, uh, the, I've got the longer one here is for the website is childhoodcancerprevention.org. So, uh, so again, ch childhoodcancerprevention.org uh, and we'll put that up in the chat box. Deborah, if you could just put that up. Uh, for uh, all folks, that would be great. And I don't know what happened here, but why don't we, you know, uh, sort of open this up now to others if there are other comments or questions that folks have, uh, get us back to the last slide. Anyone want to jump in with a question? David, I don't know whether folks need to raise their hands to um, be unmuted if they're attendees. All right, I will look. Uh, uh, God. Oh, I did it again. All right, let me look up here. All right. No open questions. Um, I'm looking at participants. Uh, the attendees, I don't see anything there yet. So I don't see anything. So we'll just turn back, you know, uh, let, let me just turn to NSA for a moment. You know, NSA, the Children's Environmental Health Network has been at this for a long time and the like, you know, what, what do you see different about this moment you know, in terms of, you know, the kind of work that's needed that, you know, you know, has just been built off of the years of experience that you and other groups you've been working with have had. Thank you so much. So those that don't know the Children's Environmental Health Network is knocking on the door of almost 30 years of just simply trying to ensure that all communities uh, uplift and put children first in all that we're doing. So that means uh, standard setting, policy making, uh, you name it. And unfortunately, that's not where we have been. And what we hear a lot is that we are living in unprecedented times. Yes, we have been dealing since the Industrial Revolution with chemicals in a lot of our products, no doubt. However, the, as, as to what Bobby spoke a lot on, on the policies and the lack of regulation that have been happening, in particular under this administration, it is becoming clearer and clearer each and every day. We have um, so many steps and so many movements forward that we had made collectively as advocate, partners, researchers, public health leaders, yet uh, you know, by not regulating the basic air water standards just for start, 
uh, that so many of us have worked so hard for. We just passed a 50th anniversary of uh, Earth Day, Earth Day uh, just recently. Um, all of these provisions that have lifted up the pillars of that entire movement, the environmental justice movement, the social justice movement, human rights, uh, we are dismantling it all right before our eyes. And sadly, the COVID crisis is also amplifying this need to protect our most vulnerable. And when it comes to childhood cancers, because of the rates that we are seeing as well, they may be, if you will, to, to some people, small increments. The point is every single year, those rates are increasing. So how much longer do we wait? Uh, how much longer do, how many more children uh, have to be diagnosed with these rare and awful forms of cancer? How many more families have to go through this type of stress and struggle, and in many cases, even lose their young children? Uh, we, we all say the time is beyond uh, we are all ready to take action, kids first. It's something that we should all be able to do to see that our current and next generation uh, are as healthy, as safe and protected as they can be so that they're not vulnerable to certain uh, viruses and other uh, health ills and social ills. So the timing is critical. The fact, again, that we have such a unique partnership here and no doubt will continue to grow. And that I think also a lot of our American public has had enough. And I think once the science is brought to their attention and not dismantled and attacked, I really honestly do believe that we have legislators in many, in, in federal government, but also lots of state legislative governments who want to do the right thing for families, for justice, for our economy, uh, for overall protections. Great, thank you. So if folks want to type into the chat, any questions, we'll take them. But Bobby, you know, as you know, the work you do and, uh, you know, around policy in New York State and the like, but also, you know, in tracking some of the policies that we're all working on to try and pass, you know, a lot of the legislatures, you know, have been relatively closed down at the state level and the, and the like for a while. But, you know, as they move back up, you know, one of the conversations that ASBC is leading is, you know, when reopening the economy, what does this look like and how do we use this moment to sort of talk about public policy in a different way that also addresses the moment that we're in now and will be hopefully moving out of. Do you have some thoughts on the strategy for uh, addressing this? And then I see another question that's come in. So we'll take sure. that next. Well, first, I would be remiss if I didn't note that today is actually the anniversary of New York's passing, both of our houses passing our Child Safe Products Act, um, which requires disclosure of information about chemicals and children's products and also um, gives the state the ability to regulate and restrict some. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, and I think that you, the way you put it, David, is really exactly it. We've got to be thinking about what is it that we want to have come next? And we've had you know, um, the, the way in which um, we can see patterns of injustice playing out and who is most affected by COVID tells us the kind of actions that we need to be taking. And I think that uh, legislatures need to be following that as well and um, recognizing that the economy and the society of tomorrow needs to, to correct those so that, um, you know, we're not uh, further placing people who have already been put at risk or in harm's way at further harm's way. Um, so I think that there's a real opportunity. Um, and also I think that right now we're learning a lot about prevention, right? I mean, all of us in our own homes, the fact that you're seeing my DVDs behind me and not, you know, um, one of our, you know, th pieces of uh, bill legislation, bill signings that we have on the wall at our office is because we're all collectively preventing disease right now. Right, we're all collectively staying home and making those choices, and I think it's an it's a really important time to really make those connections and help us see how prevention can can play out uh, on a much broader scale and on other issues that we've perhaps accepted for too long. Um, I mean, just the fact that we can all see clearer air, the fact that we aren't traveling, it, it's I think it's an inspiring moment to look at what we can do when we all come together. Um, and I hope that we, we take those lessons as well as the, the harsher truths that COVID-19 has brought to us. Great. And so again, if there's questions, uh, let's see. So he says, but besides, we've got one is besides amplifying the need to protect the most vulnerable, what do you think other impacts of COVID-19 will be? Will it amplify environmental impacts of cancer, 
disease or will it distract from it? Anyone want to take that? I'll jump in real quick. Thank you for that important question, which the Cancer Free Economy Network is actually discussing on a weekly basis at this point, along with many of our networks, right? The bottom line is, I believe everyone's eyes are open. Everyone is connected to this right now. For example, when you talk about climate change or, or other issues that we all deal with that have direct implications on the health well-being of children or other vulnerable populations, a lot of the times you hear, oh, I don't, you know, people don't really, they can't relate, they can't see it in front of them. In some cases, depending on the communities they're in, no matter what tier of, of place that we are, uh, most of us, I think, are doing okay. We're sheltering in place. Many of us are working, you know what I'm saying? We're with their families and healthy. Many other communities are not experiencing that right now. They're frontline workers, people are losing lives, people are hospitalized. And because of these underlying issues, we also know uh, that children you know, uh, going through cancer treatments or anyone going through cancer treatments in particular are high risk uh, for now uh, potentially uh, becoming infected with this virus or any virus. You're always immunocompromised anytime you know, you're dealing with a major illness like this. So I think we have nothing but an opportunity not to take advantage of, but to take it, but to lean on the awareness, the awake, you know, people being awake about these issues and to link, you know, the natural linkages that are there, that uh, whether it's this or any other major catastrophic issues coming our way, if we don't work on prevention, if we don't prepare, and if we don't heed the science that is right before us, we will fail. Um, our children and other vulnerable populations. Great. I'm wondering, uh, you know, if Molly or Howard, you have anything else that you want to add at the moment? I would be supportive, certainly. Uh, I think NSA really made, uh, gave a good answer to your question because right now is, is just such a great example. We are controlling exposure while working on eliminating or reducing hazard. And we wouldn't have done it this way had this not occurred, but we can learn from it. And we can build within a vibrant economy these things where we can control exposure and accelerate with the same level of urgency. How do we reduce and, and eliminate that hazard. And that's what, that's just, it's an opportunity we would not have asked for, but would, it's an opportunity we'd be foolish uh, to walk away from. Great, thanks, Howard. Molly, any last words for today? Yeah, I think it's just amplifying what my colleagues have said before. I mean, I think what COVID is doing is shedding a bright spotlight on prevention on the need for prevention. And, you know, this is something that is often so overlooked um, and moreover, it's shedding a bright spotlight on public health, um, on environmental health. And so, you know, to end say his remarks, I, you know, we just have to capitalize on this moment. And, you know, it's also obviously, that, you know, shedding huge, um, a spotlight on disparities and vulnerabilities um, that we see all the time in environmental health and it's just come to fruition and, and how, how the COVID is impacting our community. So um, I think it's just showcasing what's, what's possible and also the work ahead. Great, so as my computer goes wild onto itself, mm -hmm. you know, I just wanna appreciate, you know, uh, you know uh, the panelists, but all of you others that have taken the time today and again, invite you to join us, check out the, the, the website, send us an email, you know, join us, you know, as we move this cross-sector work, this collaborative work forward to, to move us towards the world in which children, you know, uh, childhood cancer, you know, is prevented because we've addressed the impact of toxic chemicals in our products, in our world and the like. That's something that's within our means to be able to do. And so we really appreciate, you know, um, everyone's time today. And uh, everyone, please, thank you and stay safe, stay healthy, and, you know, stay in touch as we move this work forward. Yes. Amen. Thank Be you well, all. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you.